U.S. making progress toward creating a domestic supply chain for electric vehicle battery production. Jeremy Michalik is director of Carnegie Mellon's Vehicle Electrification Group. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, nice to be with you today. Good to see you. Thanks for being with me. So, Jeremy, what is the current status of the EV battery supply chain with regard to how much the U.S. is still relying on China for all aspects of that supply chain? Yeah, we did a study earlier this year looking at that, quantifying how much of the supply chain runs through China. And China really dominates multiple stages of the supply chain. It's not that all the materials are mined in China. They're certainly not. But for example, an awful lot of lithium is produced in Australia and almost all of it goes to China for processing. So China dominates in processing a bunch of the critical materials, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, as well as making cathodes and then making the batteries. And so that means if there's a disruption in China for any reason, an intentional geopolitical strategy or a pandemic or you know a collapse of the economic system or something, any of those kinds of disruptions would decimate the uh, the supply chain for electric vehicle batteries. And the problem is only considered, I mean, if this if this state of affairs continues with the increase in EV purchases and battery and our need for batteries, it, I would imagine the situation would only get worse. But OK, so along comes the Inflation Reduction Act, which was signed into law in August of 2022. One of the intentions of that was to relieve our dependence on China for EV battery production, as well as other types of uh, materials and manufacturing sources. So how has it helped the U.S. to date to be more competitive with China in the EV battery production area? Yeah, so the Inflation Reduction Act, the largest climate, act, act, uh, climate policy we've ever had, and it provides really large incentives for diversifying the supply chain for electric vehicle batteries. In fact, if you can qualify for all of the incentives, you can get more uh, incentive money in than it costs to make the batteries. Um, mm. It's hard to qualify for all of those credits though. Um, they have a bunch of restrictions, um, but we're talking a very large amount uh, of incentives. And we have seen since the Inflation Reduction Act passed, an increase in the number of projects that have uh, been started and just new facilities in the United States, primarily downstream, uh, you know, manufacturing of uh, cells and packs and that kind of thing. Well, what do we mean when we use the word credits? I mean, how does that translate into actual uh, benefit to manufacturers if they shift their supply chain away from China? Yeah, so there's several different kinds of credits. The two main ones are the 30D credits, which uh, give about 70, up to $7,500 uh, for the purchase of an electric vehicle, but you can only qualify. So that's the biggest one. And you can mm -hmm. only qualify for that now if your supply chain completely avoids any entity de designated by the United States as being a foreign entity of concern. Mm -hmm. And China is on that list, China, Russia, Iran, and uh, North Korea. And so um, since China plays such a dominant role, it's very difficult to have a supply chain that avoids China entirely, but you have to avoid China entirely if you want access to those largest credits. It's hard to conceive of a single instance of where that might be the case when it comes to EV battery production. Are there indeed some supply chains or some aspect where China is not a factor at all? Yes. In fact, the, the model Tesla Model 3, I think, qualifies for right. the 30D credits. So it does happen, uh, but it's difficult um, to avoid uh, China involved, China's mm -hmm. involvement. Okay, uh, so those credits are available at time of purchase for the vehicle. Is that it? I mean, when when do they come into play? Yes, they're, those are for vehicle purchase. In fact, there's a way around those restrictions, which is instead of selling the vehicle, lease the vehicle. Because if you lease the vehicle to a consumer, it doesn't fall under the 30D anymore. It falls under an alternative, The uh, what is it, the 45W. <laughs> and 45W is uh, intended for commercial vehicles, but le when you lease the vehicle and the company still owns the vehicle, it's counted as a commercial vehicle. So basically by leasing instead of selling, you can get around the restrictions on having China involved in the supply chain. Okay, so it's all well and good that these credits are available. You may or may not be able to qualify for all of them, but then you have the idea of how is it practical, to what extent is it possible to maintain a domestic EV battery supply chain? Um, other than you, you, you reference Tesla as one example, but in a broader sense, is there's not work to be done to create the infrastructure that would even make it possible to qualify for these credits? Yeah, of course. And, and the nice thing is that, you know, the mining is more distributed. The mining is not uh, concentrated in China. It's concentrated wherever the particular materials are located in the ground, you know, where we, mm -hmm. where we get them out. 
Um, so the issue is that they get moved for refining in China and then into cathode production. Those are all things that could happen anywhere. I mean, there's nothing specific about the geography of China that, that has to happen there. It's just that there's been an enormous amount of investment in China to mm. uh, build that, that uh, industry and infrastructure. So we are seeing uh, growth of that infrastructure, not only domestically. I mean, domestically is important, but the IRA doesn't require everything to be domestic. It, um, it, as long as there's a diverse supply chain that avoids the foreign entities of concern, you still get access to a lot of these incentives. Yeah. And so there has been a lot of growth. It's been more, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on the later stages of the supply chain, like in producing cells and battery packs, and less so on refining. And I think that remains to be seen as to whether this foreign entity of concern ruling, which is only coming into effect really now, mm -hmm. whether that is going to be enough to encourage automakers to switch their supply chain entirely to avoid China, or whether they'll just move heavily toward leasing as a way to get around the rule instead. Okay, well, you say that the refining is a big issue still with China, but we still hear when it comes to like rare earth minerals, for instance, we hear that China is still very dominant in the mining aspect of it as well. We're seeing efforts to change that. We've seen efforts to reopen or open mines in the United States. You mentioned Australia as well, but still not to the degree that it would make a huge difference. I mean, China is still the, the dominant miner of these minerals, is it not? Yeah, that's true. I mean, rare earth min minerals were outside the scope of our study. We were focused on battery production. Those are often used in like uh, making uh, motors. Oh, I see. So and they're not they're not uh, that uh, important to be incorporated into the batteries themselves. The key um, uh, rare uh, the key um, um, minerals, critical materials that go into batteries are lithium, cobalt, manganese, and nickel. I see. I see. Okay. So that's not in one of like the so-called 17 or however many rare earth minerals there are that go into other aspects of this. All yeah. right. So again, to distinguish between these upstream and downstream aspects is a complex supply chain. Uh, you have credits that for cell and module credits, you have material extraction and processing credits. So in the, I think in the latter case, maybe those are less of a factor, as you said, uh, they're more modest. Um, help me to help me to better understand wh exactly which kind of credits are really um, most attractive and most possible right now. Yeah, so it's true. Those are the forty five X credits. Those are the ones that we haven't really talked about yet, mm -hmm. and those are smaller than the thirty D. They're the thirty D are the seventy five hundred that you get when you sell the vehicle. The forty five X are the ones that apply to. Um, uh, to domestic production of of uh, like uh, batteries and modules and such. Right. And um, those are uh, smaller than the the biggest ones, but they're still a big deal. Even if you don't qualify for the 30D, the credits that you get from 45X are still enough to change competitiveness. I mean, U.S. Um, production cost is higher than in China, but you put those credits in and it becomes really competitive. And so mm -hmm. they're enough to switch the you know, which location is cheapest for manufacturing some of the battery chemistries. How do these advantages change when we're talking about the different types of batteries? On one hand, we have lithium iron phosphate. And on the other hand, we have nickel and cobalt based batteries. Yes. Yeah, so nickel and cobalt based batteries are a bit more expensive to produce than lithium iron phosphate. They've been dominant, but there is a movement now toward lithium iron phosphate, which is a bit cheaper the main disadvantage of lithium iron phosphate is that it's not as energy dense. And so um, it's often not used in the higher range models. Like if you buy a low range Tesla Model 3, you're going to get a lithium iron phosphate battery or the standard range. But if you buy the extended range, then you'll switch over to a, a nickel uh, based chemistry. So the Inflation Reduction Act uh, provides incentives for both. The incentives are a bit larger for the nickel cobalt based chemistries because they're based on the cost of producing the batteries. And since those batteries are more expensive, you get a bit of a higher incentive. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we see the lithium iron phosphate as perhaps a chemistry that it's a bit easier to reduce the supply chain uh, disruption vulnerabilities because they only have one main critical material, lithium. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about disruptions to cobalt and nickel and manganese. It's just lithium. And so that means that it's potential. there's a potential to um, you know, have a supply chain that's less vulnerable as long as we could build the infrastructure for making those chemistries outside of China, which is a little tricky to do when China is making them so inexpensively right now.
Yeah. Where do you see this going in the future, Jeremy? Do you think the idea of an eventual EV battery supply chain that is 100% domestically sourced, is that even a practical notion to consider? Well, I mean, we're still going to have to get the raw materials from places where they exist in the ground. And the U.S. just doesn't have all the raw materials we would need. I mean, we're going to have to be, uh, you know, it's going to have to be global trade. And I don't think there's anything wrong with global trade. I mean, as long as it's diversified, the 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 vulnerabilities are are you know, moderate. In fact, they can be lower than trying to do everything domestically, where a single instant uh, incident uh, domestically could affect everything. It's, there's kind of some uh, risk uh, spreading out when you kind of are trading internationally. The trouble is when you have such a concentration in China, which is we definitely have right now. And yes, I do think that a movement toward less concentration in China, not avoiding China entirely in the supply chain, they're going to continue to be a very big player in the supply chain. But just diversification, just having more options is going to reduce that vulnerability and make the whole supply chain more resilient. Jeremy McCarlick of Carnegie Mellon, thank you so much for bringing us up to date on where we are in efforts to reduce our reliance on China for aspects of the uh, EV battery supply chain. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much.